I'm going to interview everybody because I want to give everybody a chance to tell their story. But more so, black people, African Americans, you need to see us in this positive light. You need to see us as intellects. You need to see us as more than just actors and playing and people that play sports and do music. Black lives, black people are seen in a negative light, dramatic, fighting all the time. Like this is what the TV shows and the media portray us as. So me, with this opportunity that I have with the TV show, I'm not going to show that. I'm going to showcase us as intellects. I'm going to showcase us as smart and cool. I am absolutely unapologetically black. Good afternoon, kings and queens. On this edition of Underground, I'm sitting with Chef Lindsay. How you doing, Chef? Wonderful, and yourself? Doing good. Thank you for joining us today. So we're going to get into some questions. First of all, tell the people who is Chef Lindsay. I'm Chef Lindsay. is a French-trained chef. Um, I am the owner of Vital Care Concierge Food Service, Black Pepper Bistro, Venice Steakhouse and Seafood. I am the chef to a lot of NBA, WNBA, as well as uh, R&B entertainers. WNBA, any names that you can drop? Um, yes, Tina Thompson. I have done some things for her in the past. Um, Cheryl Swoops as well. Nice. Um, who else have you cooked for? Um, of course, Steve Francis, Katina Mobley, Sean Kemp, <laughs> to name just a few. Um, I have a couple of NFL players um, that I cook for, Andre Johnson, um, you just name it, the list kind of goes on and on. Nice. How was it cooking for Steve Francis? Steve and I have been together for a very, very, very long time. Um, I met Steve back in 2002, I believe. Yeah, 2002. And um, I was actually a bartender when I met him. Hmm. And uh, at the time, uh, when he got ready to do the three-way tray with himself, Katino Mobley, and I want to say um, Kevin Cato. So when I did the three-way trade, um, I ended up going to culinary school. And so whenever he came back, you know, we would just kind of get together and I would do things for him. And it just went from, you know, little small things to just being his chef. Gotcha. As far as locations or food trucks or anything like that, tell us something about your restaurants where we can get your food. Well, currently right now I'm a private and personal chef. Uh, we're looking for locations to uh, open up the Black Pepper Bistro. But we do have an online service, which is uh, lindsaycaters.com. And uh, on that online, you can get our gumbo. People say gumbo is something that you get when it's cold. That's not necessarily true. No, um, you eat your chicken hot. <laughs> you eat your rice hot. Yeah. So why wouldn't you have gumbo 365 days a year? Mm -hmm. And so that's something that I want to do is take that stigma off people thinking that you can only have some, you know, like how you crave crawfish. Mm -hmm. So people crave gumbo. And so I wanted to bring them something, um, and we have two gumbos. One is called a Yaya, uh, which is really, really unique. You still get the rich flavors of gumbo, uh, but instead it's boneless. And so if you've eaten gumbo, have you ever had to go through the changes of having to pick the bones and the shells and all that? You just want to eat. Yes. So we created something that gave you all the rich flavor of gumbo, but without the bones and the shells. So you still have the chicken, the andouille, you still have the um, crawfish, the crab, and you get that rich roux and the okra, mm -hmm. and you can just eat until you pass out. As far as location, we know you're looking for a new location, but what happened to the previous location that you had here in Houston? Um, the previous location, which was Black Pepper Bistro, um, San Felipe and Sixth Stand, of course, when the hurricane came through, you know, that entire area. Uh, was underwater and, and that was Hurricane Harvey that was Hurricane Harvey okay. and so that entire location was underwater um, the building that we were in it took a long time of course we're recovering people coming out and getting beds to come out and repair the damages and for the time that it took for them to come and you know start trying to clean, clear that building out a lot of stuff was lost a lot of equipment was lost so at that point we just kind of decided you know We'll just relocate. We'll find another place to um, go and give something to the people. And even though we were in the uh, Galleria area, um, it was more of people coming in quickly. Mm -hmm. And in and, and my mind, that was a great thing. People coming in quickly, getting the food. They don't have to worry about um, parking, uh, grab and go. But I wanted to find something that was more family oriented where people can actually sit down and enjoy the environment, enjoy the food. With that plan, such a big part. Um with location and if it's needed, if there's a demand for it, will 
the price range that for your restaurant will that change depending on where depending on where you go yes but for me um, anywhere that I do go I want to go somewhere where that price range makes sense um, it's like when you go to some lounges or whatever and they have ballet parking you know you don't want to kill the people with the, the price or you taking their money in ballet and it takes away from their experience at the restaurant you want to make sure that you have something that they're comfortable going to. The food is great. The price point is great. Mm -hmm. You know, you'll keep coming over and over again if that money makes sense and the food makes sense. Um, so we know that you were a speaker for NASA Women's Forum. Uh, tell the people about that. How was that experience? Why did why were you able to take advantage of that? Did they reach out to you? What was that process? Um, for this event, um, I have to thank Chef April Thompson. April is Kyrie, or was Kyrie Irving's chef. Thankfully, due to social media, we kind of formed the friendship mm -hmm. that allowed us to come together as black female chefs. A lot of people don't know that um, that industry is dominated by male chefs. And so um, she invited me to come out to Cleveland, and um, they did this thing with um, NASA and women empowerment. Um, talking about what we do and how we do what we do on a daily basis and what um, makes us competitive, more competitive than men and anybody else out there. And I don't want to necessarily just say men, but again, it's it's, it's dominated mm -hmm. by men and what we have to do to keep reinventing ourselves to make people want to kind of come out and say, you know what, I want her to be a part of what I do. But NASA basically gave us the opportunity to showcase our work um, to give you an opportunity to show like some things that you'll be able to do as far as um, what would you take out into space? What would make the food a little better in space versus mm. that normal freeze-dried bananas and um, probably noodles type things, things that are you know reconstituted. So it just kind of gave you an ideal to kind of give them something that they can actually have to make it a little bit more tolerable because most people that go out in the space, they're there for about anywhere from 200 days to an entire year. So you just try to make it more comfortable. So they're just incorporating chefs into making that process a little bit less standard. So were you able to eat some of the, the food that they have before to kind of get a gauge of how it tastes? Oh. I've always wondered how that food Oh tastes. yeah, that's just god awful. <laughs> that's, that's just god awful. Oh, oh my god. That, that's the worst thing in the entire where I don't wish that on anybody. Mm, that bad. It's that bad. It's like um, powdered flavored cardboard box. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Tell me about uh, social media, how that works for you. Because I know me, of course, um, having a, a production company and then also being a talk show host. Of course, that helps me out. And to a lot of people, I'm an old man. So, like, with working with technology and social media, is, is learning a lot, it's a lot of different things. How does that work in the chef world, or I guess in the cooking world? Well, social media gives you an opportunity to um, recognize a lot of other chefs, um, see what you do. A lot of people think that everything is brand new. Mm -hmm. Nothing is really brand new. Everything is reinvented. Gotcha. And so um, you can take something as simple as bananas foster, or something as simple as banana pudding uh, for me, uh, banana pudding is your typical, uh, if you remember when you were kids, uh, banana pudding was a thing that had the um, wafers and the bananas and the pudding. But when you reinvent something as simple as that, you take like, um, uh, instead of graham cracker, you can take like the plantains and rum mm -hmm. and um, take some vanilla bean and just enrich it and you make mouth watering <laughs> over here. <laughs> uh, you know, add like a, a, re a reduced bourbon to it. So, yeah. You know, again, it's it's just watching, get a chance to watch other people reinvent something. Mm -hmm. And the great thing I love about social media, unlike when I first started doing this, you had to really get out there and try to get your name out there. Social media is a free platform to showcase whatever you do. Here's the thing, when you hashtag what you do, if you're looking for something in particular, like I have these gentlemen um, that are in Washington DC. They're doing very very well um, They found me on social media mm. And so when the opportunity presents itself whenever I go to DC I try to make sure that I get a chance to go out there and see um, see them and you know See the great things that they're doing and the things that they're doing in the community 
which has also motivated me to do things in the community as well. Plug yourself. Uh, let all the people know what your social medias are. Like, if you're only on Instagram, fine. But any other ones where people can reach out to you, of course, your email. But I want people to be able to say, hey, I follow Chef Lindsay on Instagram, saw whatever. So tell them what those are. Okay, I am I am underscore Chef Lindsay on Instagram. I am underscore Chef Lindsay on Twitter. Lindsay Caters and Company on Facebook. Also, um, Black Pepper Bistro on Facebook. Venice Steakhouse and Seafood on Facebook. Starting out, you know, I don't know, young girl, preteen, at what point did we decide and say, I definitely know for sure that I want to be a chef for, you know, a living and this is what I'm going to do to make money. This is my passion. When did that start and how did that grow and evolve? Well, for me, um, as a little girl, uh, my mother was a single parent. And uh, my sister and I are seven years apart. What I ended up doing, um, I remember I had to be about 11, I want to say. Mm. And uh, we, were, we were called what's called latchkey kids. And I remember having to do um, sandwiches and cereal, the safe stuff, mm -hmm. um, to keep from burning down the house. <laughs> and so eventually I got to a point where I was tired of eating those sandwiches every single day until my mom got home. And I called my aunt. And I said to her, like, I really want some chicken. And so my, my aunt is from the South, and, you know, I love her to death, but I have to, I have to say this every time I tell this story. She was like, well, Ned, now you know, if you burn that house down, <laughs> don't you tell your mom, don't you tell your mom I was trying to tell you how to cook chicken. And so when we started out, she kind of told me how, you know, to thaw the chicken and you know, season it up and, you know, don't have the fire too hot, too, too hot, too low. And uh, my first true experience was frying chicken. Mm -hmm. Now, mind you, you may have had high uh, cholesterol or you may have had, um, you know, a heart attack maybe after her because it was salty <laughs> as heck. But, I, you know, I tried and then something in me was like, you know, I can do this. I know I can do this. And so, but my mom, she came home and she was so impressed at the fact that I tried to do something. In my mind, my mother's out working every day. And so, uh, she was so impressed that I tried to do something where when she came home, all she had to do was come home, eat and relax and enjoy that time with yes. us. Mm -hmm. But, take a pause from that. I will say this, not to brag, I was a student that was kind of um, accelerated. Mm -hmm. So I took, um, I think they call them AP courses here in Houston, accelerated courses where in Louisiana. Yeah. And so I was kind of ahead of myself. So my dad always said, you know, do something that you don't know, do something that you don't wouldn't normally do. So I ended up going to Southern University and I took um, courses, got my bachelor's degree in business administration. Mm -hmm. um, but even at Southern University on the weekends, I would usually kind of cook for my sweet mates. Yeah. And I remember growing up when I played basketball, we used to go to McDonald's all the time. We went from McDonald's to, hey, I can cook at home. Mm -hmm. Still not dawning on me that this is something that was secretly building up mm -hmm. as I got older. Um, when I moved to Houston, took a job, business manager with an insurance company. Um, met a guy by the name of Timothy Bro. Um, as I stated before, Sean Kemp, uh, Nick Van Exel, so those guys, and uh, Chris Tellison, who owned this place down the street uh, that was called Simpers that everybody went to. And uh, so when I started, you know, forming these friendships, I remember show what I would say, well, can you come over here and just cook something? And I would come and just cook, and I enjoyed it, and I enjoyed it. And some of the guys that he knew that played basketball would come over, and it was just like I just kind of had my heart fluttered just being able to show them what I could do and it just kind of went from there and I just not I didn't know that it was building up inside of me that I don't want to sit at a desk every day mm -hmm. and I want to do this I am at peace when I do this and uh, when I got the opportunity to uh, go overseas to work for the insurance company and they sent me back and then they decide to downsize now you can't have me working overseas and from home for nine ten years and tell me you need to come back into the office. Mm -hmm. And at that point, I made a decision. I'm just going to do what I love. 
and I've not turned back since. I've been chefing ever since 2004. What I, what I try to tell people though, like when people ask me how did I get started, um, even though I decided to do what I love to do, it was still a struggle. Because here's the thing, you have to make people want you. And it's not just about you liking my food. It's, it's a bigger picture than that. Yeah. You have to be someone that people flock to. Um, people look at you and say, like, you know, I really like what she's doing. How can I, you know, I, I have a couple of chefs that ask me all the time. Uh, my assistant, uh, my sous chef, my cook, my line cooks have always, they picked my brain. And I told them this was not an easy journey. I started out on Bissonette in a little small, um, I want to say it was like a room. Um, and I just kind of had people in and out, but I knew it was bigger than that for me. And so I took advantage of social media to just to kind of go back to that. I took advantage of social media to make that work for me. And I've told my chefs and people that I've met over the years, your food can taste great, but people eat with their eyes. Mm. And you have to make it look great. And then you have to create this aura about yourself that makes people want to flock to you and look at you and say, I like what she does and I want to do what she does on a daily basis. So um, I will tell Chef Eddie and Chef Brandon, hey, paint a picture of your food. Don't just do like your aunts and uncles, um, your aunt Riri and, and, and them, and just throw the food in the pan. I don't care if you're just making pancakes. Make those pancakes the best looking pancakes that you've ever done and plate it. So it's not just about cooking. It's not just you, about it cooking. It has to taste good. Taste it good. has to look good. Exactly. And then also you have to sell yourself sell in yourself. order to you know yeah, reach yeah. that level. Exactly. Okay. So you talked about cooking fried chicken as a youngster. Um, your auntie gave you some pointers or whatever. We know um, just for conversations that we've had previously um, at the Cigar Lounge that you also do some parent kid cooking classes. Um, uh, tell the people about that. Well, we have what's called um, Families on the Go. Basically, that what that does is incorporates uh, family time. So um, our services allows us to come to the schools, um, after school care, mm -hmm. come to the schools and just pretty much show, like a lot of kids come home from school by themselves. And so what we do is show families how they can interact with their children and create these dishes that are kind of like four or five, you know, ingredients at a minimum and so with that being said uh, these are kitchen friendly sandwiches and pastas believe it or not or soups that you can kind of pre-prep for the kids and that way they can just put the sauces together something as simple as um, heavy cream um, a little um, something with chard something with turkey or whatnot but basically like I said it's just something that takes that time Families on the goes allowed these these uh, families to interact with one another um, because again, as I was a kid, all I wanted my mom to do was to come home and spend time with us. Mm -hmm. And so that program allows the child and the parents to interact and talk and also have that same time to get work done yeah. when they get home from school. So, um, and we also come into the household and take away from that time because it's a simple, simplified menu. So we can still come into the household and take about an hour of their time. So that same hour was spent with the kids while we're sitting there doing the prep for them. Families on the go, is that a website that people can go to or? Um, well, right now we are we have so many companies under Lindsay Caters and Company. Mm -hmm. And so Families on the Go would be one, Vital Care um, Concierge Food uh, Service, basically our meal prep plan. Mm -hmm. uh, Vital Care is also under that same umbrella. Gotcha. Okay. I just so Vital Care Food Prep Company and Families on the Go, right? Families on the Go. Correct. All right. So y'all can reach out, get your kids, uh, get a little bit more time with your kids while you get your food prepared for you. Um. So what I want to know is because I'm making this slow transition to vegan, right? And I know I got a lot of followers out there, a lot of people out there that want to know about healthier food options. And I am by all means no chef. I can cook. But I'm not a chef. What are some healthier options that you would recommend that are more on the easy side for people that are like me that want to cook for themselves but they're not, you know, a great chef? You can always call Vital Care, <laughs> Concierge <laughs> Food Service, and we will take care of that for you. Mm -hmm. But 
um, unselfishly, I will say this. Um, a lot of people have a tendency not to look into different vegetables. Um, a lot of people don't know there's rainbow chard. Have you heard of rainbow chard? I have not. Rainbow chard, there's uh, purple asparagus, purple cauliflower. Um, there is, uh, of course, you know, the white cauliflower. And uh, But you have to look into different um, types of food, the radish. Um, seasoning is important. Uh, taking sodium, reducing the sodium out of your diet, reducing the sugars out of your diet. Um, you can't do, even though, like for instance, you're going vegan, um, a lot of people don't understand, like, if you want to go with sauces. A lot of sauces that are already made are full of sugar mm. for the sodium, and that's because it's being preserved. Um, you don't realize that you can do something as simple as take a tomato, score the tomato, which is basically um, cutting a, a X across it, dropping it in the water and just letting it blanch. And the reason why you score is because it'll make the um, the um, skin of the, the tomato peel back. And when it starts to peel back, you know it's ready. You just simply shock it. Hmm. Shock it, peel it off, puree it, tomato sauce. So now for people that don't know, now I've worked in a couple of restaurants okay. and in hotels while I worked in the kitchen, so I know what it is to shock and blast. But tell the people, what it is to shock, what it means to shock and blanch. Um, what it means to shock and blanch. For instance, um, green beans, um, asparagus. Yes, when asparagus. you're eating something like that, you don't want to cook all the nutrients out of it. So basically, you'll cook it, still have a firm and crispness to it, but you want to stop the cooking process. So all you simply do is have an ice bath ready and you take it and drop it. So that's basically shocking it. Mm -hmm. So to stop cooking and it still have that green, because every notice, some people, like your parents growing up, you had green beans, but they was gray. They were grayish green beans, and that's because they cooked them to death. <laughs> There's no nutritional value left. It's yeah. just the green. Well, it's just the gray bean mm -hmm. that's left. And so, basically, what that does is um, it stops it from cooking, it shocks it, and it keeps that crispness about it. And you still have those um, that nutritional value, those vitamins that you need, um, in order uh, basically to stop from de defeating the purpose of just saying, "Hey, I had green beans today." No, you really didn't. Yeah, great beans. You had great beans. <laughs> uh, what's next for you, Chef Lindsay? As far as we know, we the restaurant you're working on a location for that. But any events coming up? Um, what's next? I am currently working with Walmart um, to get our gumbo line, our etouffees in the store. Um, we have a lot of people that call us. Uh, we ship as far as Canada. Um, so right now, I'm trying to get those um, things to, um, going. Walmart has contacted me uh, via email. So basically, I just kind of have to get my uh, global tax ID number together. Um, they basically they look at your um, your branding, your logos. Mm -hmm. um, if it's something that's chef friendly, and kind of determine whether or not uh, to be something that either you buy chef space or they'll pay for the chef space. Um, the other thing that I plan on doing is I'm really trying to get um, the restaurant open yeah. and uh, trying to decide if I want to still brand with Black Pepper Bistro. Mm -hmm. Or do I want to brand with the um, gumbo name, which is our Yaya? And so that's the next um, step that I'm trying to do. And then um, we're going to do some pop up. Uh, so we're going to basically do dinner pop ups in different cities and states. Um, the next thing also will be um, Diary of a White Plate. And Diary of a White Plate is the book that I have coming out. Um, we're going to have several different series of that. Um, next, we're going to just um, to close out. I always ask every guest this. It's my tagline. Um, we want to know how you keep growing, keep going, and going because there's so many people that watch um, our interviews and the things, the content that we put out, and they just, you know, need that encouragement. So, how do you keep growing? How do I keep growing? I know that there's more for me in life. Um, this is not it for me. I'm not happy. I, I surround myself with people that I know that are doing positive things. Um, I'm a firm believer if you're sitting around with people who are not doing anything, you become stagnant. Yeah. I refuse to be stagnant. God has given me the opportunity to have sight, a mind, a vision. And in my mind, that allows me just to keep moving, just to keep wanting to have more. That desire burns inside of me to be better than what I was yesterday. Yeah. The only person that I'm battling with is the person that I was last week. Mm. Okay. So, um, how do you keep glowing then? How do I keep glowing? Knowing that I could be better than the next man. Um, how do I keep going? Knowing that there are people who are watching me, 
who enjoy what I do, who want to do what I do. And that glow about myself is the ability to help others. Yeah. Um, when I met um, Chef Eddie, Chef Brandon, these guys found me on social media. And you don't know what that made me feel like to know that these guys found me on social media and they just like, hey, I, I enjoy your work and I see what you do and I just want to be a part of what you do. It told me that I'm doing something right yeah. and that these guys just like want to emulate me and then make something of their own. And I, I tell them all the time, like the greatest joy to me is when you guys call me and say, even though I always book them to do these events with me, the greatest joy is when they call me and say, hey, chef. I want to book you to do an event with me. Like it, it shows me that I've actually taught something. Um, they've actually followed something that I do. It makes so much sense. So um, I'd rather go from being the teacher to the student sometimes. Hmm. So that's that's that glow for me that makes me feel like you've learned something from me. Through it all, the successes and the I'll call them opportunities because I don't like to say failures so mm -hmm. through the successes and the opportunities that arrive how do you keep going? <sighs> failure is not an option mm. I know people say that all the time failure is not an option I mean I've had some down I've had plenty of downfalls but then I think about the good days and the good days make they outweigh the, the bad days um, without failure there's no success mm. And so, with that being said, you have to look back on the things that you did wrong and learn from it. So, with the, um, you know, for me, my restaurant that flooded, I allowed that to be in the hands of somebody else. It wasn't my building. I want my building. Mm -hmm. So, I know that I'm going to take care of my building. So, if anything happens in the future, that's on me. That's on my insurance. Because... For them, that money doesn't make sense to them because they're not getting that money. So I'm second, I'm third, or maybe fourth in line. So like I say, it, it just kind of taught me, like, stop depending on other, other people yeah. for your success. Do what you have to do to maintain you and to grow your business. And it's great that you took that as a learning lesson instead of, you know, kind of just laying down and say, oh, her, because Hurricane Harvey was bad for everybody. Like, I, I mean, I was affected. There were so many people that were affected. And it's a lot of people that were like you that just kept going. And they was like, I'm not going to, I'm going to learn from this and I'm going to keep going. But there's also a lot of people, too, that were like, oh, I'm going to be a victim. And, you know, Hurricane Harvey did this and did that to me and just ruined my life. So oh, yeah. I'm glad you're putting that positive message out there, not just for other shelves, but just for people, period, that, period, period, you know, right. do for yourself and don't depend on other people and don't act as if you're a victim from a flood, from anything. Like, just keep going. Right. And, and it, it hurts. It hurts. And you have to have the hurt because once you get that hurt, that hurt should build a fire mm -hmm. in your heart to want to do something else, to... to you know, let me think about what I can do better. Yeah, it flooded. Okay, but what could I have done? Instead of saying, what could I have done and then being sad about it, be positive about it. You know, okay, it happened. What do I have to do next time to make this better and not have to worry about this? So, last but not least, um, do you need any help? Are you hiring for anything in any of the places um, that you have, things that are open? And any advice, you know, that you could just give ex other expiring chefs, women and men? Um, currently, right now, I'm not hiring. Um, we're still working on looking at locations in Missouri City, but uh, when we do start the hiring process, I am looking for new faces. I do take people who are looking for their externships. Um, so if you want to get that experience, you know, you can reach out to me at um, lindsaycaters at gmail.com or you can call me at 281-406-0798, which is a business line, and I'll leave a message. Um, I do like to give people the opportunity to kind of be hands-on. Mm -hmm. And even if you're not in culinary school, if that's something that you think you want to do, you have a passion for, then I will take people who want to come and just kind of like uh, shadow me yeah. for the day. So we'll do that, you know, just kind of like, you know, is this something I really, really, really want to do? Because people look at the pictures and think that it's just easy. Mm -hmm. And some things are easy, but it's a lot of work behind that picture of food gotcha. that you see. You touched on earlier how it's so diverse in it being a male-dominated industry, which is very surprising to me because since whatever, 
the civilization started, women have always been cooking for everybody. Right. You know, even during slavery times, all the black women cook for everybody. You might have to edit that out. But, um, you know, I don't, it's surprising to me that more, there aren't more women that right, right, are chefs. Right. Um, well, here's the thing. When I open up uh, here in Houston, um, in Dallas, um, they also open in New Orleans, and um, we were interviewing. And so when I do my interview process, you know, I want somebody who's going to be um, on time, who's passionate about what they do. But more importantly, for my women, uh, for my women, I tell them I don't take excuses. Mm -hmm. um, I've been doing this for catering. I've been doing for over 20 years. Uh, personal private chef, I've been doing now for uh, 14, 15 years. And what makes me so passionate about what I do is I don't sit around and wait for a man to come pick a pot for me. I don't wait for a man to come, you know, bring the groceries in. Like I literally was going getting the uh, to the purveyors and picking up cases of stuff. And so I tell them, look, you know, you see on those applications, are you able to lift 50 pounds more? That's serious when it comes to me. You can't call me talking about you're cramping. I don't want to hear that. If you want to be treated equally, yeah. then you have to be able to work through the pain. It is what it is. Take care of yourself. If you know you can't pick up stock pots, do some push-ups. <laughs> and I'm serious about that. Um, my son would always say, Mom, you know, let me help you do. No, because here's the thing. If I am okay with you helping me, mm -hmm. I don't want you to become dependent upon you helping me. Yeah. Um, in the restaurant, even the fryers. The fryers, you have to drain them. You have to get down in there and get everything that's yeah, left down in there and clean them out. You have to, right, you got to yeah. scrub them out. And so I recorded myself one time boiling out a fryer. And somebody says, Chef, I can't believe you're doing that. You don't have anybody to do that for you. Yes, I do. But here's the thing. When I do things like that, that makes me know that this is where I started. This is my business. And if you decide that you don't want to do X, Y, Z today, this not beneath me. You can leave. And you can do it I'll yourself. still get it done. That's and that's right. where a lot of people go wrong. They start letting people do things for them. And then they can't do it for themselves. So I make it clear that I'm hands-on in every capacity of the business. I'm going to do it for myself. And my, even in my 40s, that's probably why I'm having problems with my knee now. But um, those are battle wounds yeah. that are well-earned, well-deserved. Alright, well earned and well deserved. Well, we got a gift for you here oh, from the Undercrown team. Thank you. <laughs> also, a little card. Okay. Thank you, card, I should say. Thank you. Um, we just appreciate you so much for taking, we know you're extremely busy with um, everything that you have going on and, you know, just taking this time out to come and sit with us means okay, a lot. I appreciate that. <laughs> to Chef Lindsay, Undercrown LLC. Keep glowing, keep growing. Mm -hmm. Keep glowing. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> you know I love me some you. I do. Thank you. So, I am a cigar smoker. And this is how I met the marvelous Landon. <laughs> Landon was at one of my favorite cigar bars, which is the International House of Stogies. It's just, I feel like, so good when you can do actually do what you want to do. I know everybody says it's not about the money, but at the end of the day, you need money to live. Right. So, when you can do what you love, you know, and make money off of it. It is no longer a job. Yeah, it's got to be an amazing feeling. Those people out there, you got you in school, the girls, y'all sweet mates cooking for you. If that, she could be the next Chef Lindsay. Support her. Thank you. I appreciate that. I can add this to my humidor. There Thank you. you. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Thank y'all for joining us for this episode of Underground. Keep growing, keep blowing, keep going. Yeah, hold up,